Hello all. Uh, so we're going to be focusing for this lecture on the question of uh, what future generations might uh, judge us for, what they might condemn us for. Um, I, uh, I like to discuss, sorry, my cat is here trying to climb up if you all want to see him. Buddy, yeah. Okay. Start Paulu. Okay, so uh, we'll be talking about what future generations might condemn us for. Um, I like to discuss this question um, near the beginning of ethics courses because I always in my classes like to sort of motivate why we should care about the class at the beginning, right? Um, I want to show you guys, you know, why why you should put effort into this, why you should take this seriously. And um, one way to, to see that is to think about the fact that, well, when we look at people in the past, we see that they made all sorts of ethical mistakes. There were all sorts of things they did that were actually very bad, even though they didn't think that they were bad at the time. Maybe they should have, should have been able to see that they were bad, uh, but they didn't. And once we realize that, we might ask ourselves, are there things that we're doing? or that other people in our society are doing uh, that are actually very bad, uh, that maybe we haven't noticed, or uh, maybe uh, maybe they don't notice. Um, and if that's a real possibility, then of course, it looks like maybe ethical reflection is very important. Um, maybe it's very important that we, we not just, um, you know, go along on the basis of, whatever we happen to currently think or whatever we picked up through osmosis or whatever, but that we critically reflect on uh, ethical principles on how we ought to behave so that if we're kind of unthinkingly complicit in something that's very bad, we can, we can change and we can try to convince other people to change. So um, that's, that's one reason. It's also, this is just sort of an intrinsically interesting topic and it will connect to some substantive issues that we discuss later on and it brings up i mean it brings up a lot of stuff but one one reason i like to to discuss this is to help help us think about you know why are we why are we taking this class uh, why should we care about uh you know this this ethics stuff um so i i like to usually begin with kind of a little bio of the authors we discuss um my my thought is that maybe it helps people a little bit if they can associate arguments with particular personalities or you know a particular biography um but i actually don't know anything about evan g williams who wrote one of these articles so uh, i can't tell you anything about him i i, I tried to google him he, he i found you know at some point he was working at uh, some school in Ohio or something, but I don't know. I'm not even sure if he still works in philosophy anymore. Maybe he went off to be a lawyer or something. I don't know. Um, Kwame uh, Anthony uh, Appiah, meanwhile, any philosopher basically will will have heard of. Um, he's one of the one of the most prominent, most celebrated um, philosophers in the world, really. Um, he was born in London. His uh, mother was British and his father was from Ghana. Uh, he was raised in Ghana. Then he wound up going back uh, to Britain later and he attended Cambridge. Um, while he was there, he wrote a dissertation in probabilistic semantics, which is um, a very complicated thing. You don't need to worry about it, but it, it's it's actually nothing to do with ethics or political philosophy or anything. It's It's a very technical branch of, of philosophy of language. Um, so he, he started out doing that sort of stuff. And then later on, he began writing on issues in ethics, politics, social philosophy. Um, he's taught at Yale, Harvard, Duke, Princeton. He teaches at NYU now. He, after getting his PhD, he actually moved to the US and has taught at a, a number of American schools. Um, he used to write um, a column for the New York Times called Ask the Ethicist, where people would write in and he was the ethicist for the New York Times and, and would give people advice on, uh, on different topics. Um, he's, he's written on a, a very wide range of 
of uh, issues in ethics and in social and political philosophy, written about racism, written about um, what's called cosmopolitanism as opposed to nationalism, the, the idea that uh, cosmopolitanism has to do with what you owe to people in other societies and other countries, right? Um, uh, how do you weigh your obligations to people in your society versus your obligations to people far away um, who might be in need in some way or, or whatever? Um, he uh, he's he's gay and has written about uh, you know being gay as as a young man in Ghana. Um, so he I I said in the uh, in the first lecture um, that. Uh, you know, all of you have things to contribute to, to discussions because all of you have, you know, your own viewpoints, your own backgrounds, your own experiences that you can bring to bear. Um, and uh, I think he's actually a, a good illustration of how that's true. I mean, um, you know, I wasn't just saying that. He's, he's clearly, if you think about his biography, the fact that he's written on, say, cosmopolitanism and how the think about, you know, how you relate to people in other societies, you know, obviously that's been influenced by his own experience, having, you know, been born in one place and growing up in another place, working in another place for his, most of his adult life. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a really fascinating guy. You can find, if you go on YouTube, you can find all sorts of lectures that he's given and, and things like that. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna start with uh, the Williams piece, and then we're going to move on to the uh, Appia piece. Um, so uh, Williams starts out by noting something that I said a minute ago, and that uh, you know hardly even needs to be said, uh, which is that when we think about the various societies in the past, uh, we know that uh, they've they've done a lot of bad stuff. They've committed a lot of uh, really horrific atrocities. Um, slavery, uh, the Holocaust, uh, the genocide of the Native Americans. Um, you know, I, I could go on and on. Um, Williams writes that uh, the people who did that stained their hands with the blood of millions, left a legacy of grief and remorse, and are viewed by their descendants as a source of great shame. Um, and if I asked you to think of similar atrocities being carried out now, um, you might be able to. Maybe um, people would think of, I don't know, the war in Ukraine, or um, if you know a little bit more about, this, I mean, there are other wars happening which involve a lot of atrocities. In fact, probably more atrocities, but don't get as much uh, media attention, right? Um, the uh, the, the wars in Yemen or in uh, Ethiopia, um, uh, where, you know, huge numbers of people have been killed, huge humanitarian disasters, or maybe you would think about the way that the North Korean government treats its citizens, something like that. Um, most people probably wouldn't think about things that we're doing right now. Most people probably tend to think, uh, you know, we're doing, a, our society has problems, it has real problems, there are real injustices, but, um, you know, we're not doing anything as bad as those folks in the old days did. Um, they, they tend to think that uh, we, where, that, where we means, you know, people, liberal people living in Western societies, and in particular, you know, in America, um, uh, they tend to think we have progressed enough that we're not doing anything that badly, that, that bad, right? We do bad things, but nothing on the scale of these horrific moral catastrophes that occurred in the past. Um, alternatively, you might think, no, our society does do things that are that bad, and I know what they all are, right? I can tell you what they are. Maybe you think contributing to climate change is is as bad as some of these horrific atrocities because it's ultimately going to kill millions of people and and devastate the world for our, our for future generations. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Um, but you might think, yeah, I I I see I see these terrible things that our society does, and you know, 
I, 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 I'm not in favor of any horrible things, of course. I can see what all the terrible things are, and I, I condemn them. Um, and Williams wants to call both of those views into question. He wants to say both that our society probably is uh, involved in moral catastrophes and that you probably don't know what they all are. Maybe you have correctly identified some of them, but you probably haven't correctly identified all of them. There are probably some that you think are innocuous that actually aren't. Um, so it's, it's kind of a radical argument in that way, I guess. Um, he's, uh, he's going to provide two arguments for this though. Uh, and, uh, we can call them the inductive and the disjunctive arguments. We'll talk about why they're called that in a minute. They might, if you don't have a philosophy background, those might not be very informative names, but, um, uh, he's, he's also going to argue, even if we, uh, suppose we wind up in a situation where we think, yeah, we probably are doing something awful, but like, who knows what the awful thing is? Even if we can't identify which practices of ours constitute atrocities, um, he, he still thinks that there are important implications just from realizing that we probably are uh, bound up in, in certain moral catastrophes. Um, one is going to be that making intellectual progress so that we can figure out what, what the moral catastrophes are is really important. Um, so we should study ethics, for instance. Um, that's, a, that's a very congenial uh, conclusion for me as an ethicist. But um, the other is that we should consider it important to save resources and cultivate, cultivate flexibility so that when the time comes to change our policies, we will be able to do so quickly and smoothly. What he means is we, we want to be flexible enough that if we realize that something we're doing is really bad, we can change, we, we can stop doing it and can deal with whatever the fallout is. You know, we're not, we don't become dependent on some terrible thing that we're doing or something like that. We're going to return to both of those points um, later on and, and he'll flush them out more. Um, so, uh, as I say, he's going to argue that we're probably complicit in moral catastrophes without realizing it. Um, a moral catastrophe, as he defines it, has three features. The first is serious wrongdoing. Wrongdoing which is on a par with things like slavery or murder. You know, it's not just, uh, not just, uh, some minor minor transgression, you know, cheating on your taxes or something like that. It's very serious wrongdoing. It is large scale wrongdoing. It's not just one isolated instance of murder. It's wrongdoing on a scale similar to that of something like slavery or the Holocaust. Uh, wrongdoing that effect, that many people are involved in and that many people are affected by, or many individuals are affected by. Um, and uh, Oh, well, I, I guess, uh, I guess that sort of runs into the, the next, uh, the next point. So there's large scale wrongdoing in the sense of many people are affected by it. And then there's, uh, widespread responsibility for the wrongdoing. So very many people, uh, are committing it. So there are many individuals affected and there are many individuals, uh, responsible. Um, so, uh, the basic idea is it's, it's, very serious wrongdoing kind of on a societal scale, right? It's very serious wrongdoing that uh, involves a, a large number of people as perpetrators and as victims. Um, so his first argument is uh, uh, what we'll call the inductive argument. Um, so in, in the introductory lecture, I, I gave you, I talked to, about arguments to you guys. I showed you argument of argument forms, talked about validity, soundness, that stuff. Um, and then I said, there is a little caveat. What I'm talking about here are deductive arguments. And there are also other types of arguments that philosophers use sometimes. Well, inductive arguments are one of those other types of arguments that philosophers use. Um, roughly speaking, what induction is, is it, it involves inferring that things we haven't observed yet are going to be similar to things that we have observed. Um, so uh, sometimes what that means is we have a sample and what we're going to do is generalize about everything of the given type from that sample. So we look, we find that all the emeralds anybody has ever found are green. And so we conclude probably just all the emeralds that there are are green. 
So there we're moving from a claim about particular observations, these emeralds that we've seen, to this general claim about all emeralds, right? Um, an inductive argument could also have a particular conclusion. You might be drawing a, uh, an inference from the sample to how some particular thing will be. So you might think, well, all the emeralds we've ever observed are green, so the next emerald that we observe will be green. Um, and there you're drawing a conclusion about some particular emerald, right? Uh, statistical inferences are also inductive. Um, if you think 95% uh, of philosophy instructors have read part of the Nicomachean Ethics, it's a book by Aristotle, it doesn't matter, uh, and uh, you know that I'm a philosophy instructor and you think, okay, so I've, and you don't have any reason to think that I haven't read the Nicomachean Ethics, you might think, okay, I probably read part of the Nicomachean Ethics. Um, and that is, is a kind of inductive inference because you're drawing a conclusion about me from observed facts about philosophy instructors, right? Um, now, induction plays a very important part in our uh, everyday lives. Um, in fact, if you couldn't reason inductively, you wouldn't be able to do anything. I mean, um, when you log on here to watch this lecture, uh, you uh, are going to do that because I make an announcement that says that the lecture is available. And you think generally when professors tell you that the lecture is available, it is, right? Uh, if you thought that instead logging on was going to download a virus into your computer, uh, then you wouldn't do it, right? Um, you have to, uh, if, if you, uh, you know, if you thought that, you know, I, you're thirsty and you see a glass of water and you think, what is this water going to do if I drink it? Will it quench my thirst or will I kill me? Uh, will it kill me? If you had no idea, then you wouldn't know whether to drink the water or not, right? Um, so, uh, all of, you know, ordinary planning, scientific, uh, investigation, um, all sorts of stuff all depends upon inductive reasoning. Um, but you'll notice that inductive arguments are deductively invalid. Uh, if you think back to the previous lecture, deductive validity means that the premises entail the conclusion, right? Um, but in the arguments I just gave you, the premises do not entail the conclusion in the sense that uh, if the if the premises are true, it doesn't follow that the conclusion has to be true. It could be that all the emeralds we've ever observed are green, but there are blue emeralds somewhere. We just haven't found them yet, right? Um, so uh, deductive arguments are valid when, if the premises are true, the conclusion has to be true. Um, Inductive arguments will say are valid when, if the premises are true, the conclusion is probably true. Um, inductive arguments don't entail their conclusions, but they make their conclusions probably true if they're valid. Um, and uh, one thing to notice, it isn't always easy to tell if an inductive argument is valid. Um, if we've only ever found one emerald and I conclude that all emeralds are green, that maybe that's not, maybe I can't, maybe I just should withhold judgment until we found more, right? Uh, it's an incredibly small sample. If we found uh, 20 billion emeralds and all of them have been green and, you know, they've been taken from different places and, uh, you know, there's no reason to think our sample's biased in any way, um, then you might think, okay, yeah, uh, it seems like all the emeralds there are probably green. But like, what is the exact number where, where we should decide that all emeralds are probably green? You know, like once you found 1,703 or, well, you know, it's hard to say, right? So inductive arguments, exactly how strong any given one is, is kind of a judgment call based on, you know, how, how strong the, the sample that we have is. Um, but even though it can be hard to judge them sometimes, like I say, we have to rely on inductive reasoning all the time. Um, and uh, inductive arguments, we'll say, are, are sound if they are valid and their conclusions are, or, or sorry, and their premises are true. And so that means that the conclusion is probably true. Um, I say all that just to set up this argument that Williams is going to make, right?
turning back to the question of moral catastrophes. Um, here is William's argument. Um, look, every single society in history, all the societies that have ever existed that we know about, and our own society until very recently, uh, we, we maybe it still is, but at least we agree our own society until very recently um, has been, every society has been implicated in moral catastrophes of various sorts, right? Slavery, genocide, unjust war, discrimination, torture, uh, all sorts of stuff, right? So every single society in history has been implicated in moral catastrophes, including our own society historically. Um, and furthermore, generally the people committing these catastrophes didn't think, yeah, like I'm a terrible war criminal, you know, like, boy, people in the future are really going to think that I was a monster. Uh, people didn't think that, right? Um, the people committing moral uh, uh, catastrophes um, generally thought that they were, you know, they were pretty good. Uh, maybe they thought like, yeah, people back in the past, you know, they did terrible stuff. But like nowadays here in 1850 in uh, Charleston, South Carolina, we pretty much got society figured out, you know. Um, they Maybe they should have figured out that they were doing bad things. But most of them, in fact, whether that was through wishful thinking or just not being sufficiently reflective or whatever, most of them probably thought that what they were doing was fine. Right. They didn't think it would, that they were committing moral catastrophes. Um, and so Williams thinks, well, look, if that's true, if every society in history, everybody has been committing horrible deeds and they thought that they were fine. Uh, what are the odds that like n now, you know, just in the past couple decades, we in our society have come to be the first place that's ever existed where actually we aren't complicit in any moral catastrophes, right? Without realizing. Um, and so Williams thinks, well, that's probably not a uh, very good odds, right? Uh, 2000 years ago, the Romans who were conquering people, building an empire, crucifying people, owning slaves, doing all sorts of horrible stuff. They were congratulating themselves on being civilized because they had abolished human sacrifice. And of course, it was, that was real progress. It was good that they abolished human sacrifice, but there was a, there's a lot of progress yet to be made, right? Things, there's the, the Romans did a lot of bad stuff. Um, and uh, they didn't think, you know, they weren't sitting around thinking like, boy, if only our society was more like Washington State in the year 2020, year 2022. Uh, they, you know, they, they thought they were doing fine. Right. Um, and we are in the same position, Williams thinks. We know how much progress is embodied in our values. So he does think that society has made real progress over time. It's good that slavery was abolished. It's good that we don't crucify people anymore. Uh, it's good that, um, you know, people aren't denied the right to vote because of, well, uh, I, I guess it depends on the, the voter suppression and stuff, but at least legally, no one's supposed to be denied the right to vote because of their gender or their race or anything like that. Um, we have made real progress over time. Um, but he thinks we don't know how much progress remains to be made in the future. Most cultures have turned out to have major blind spots in their moral beliefs, and we are in much the same epistemic situation as they are, so we will probably also turn out to have major moral blind spots. Everybody else so far has uh, perpetrated moral catastrophes without thinking so. Um, so probably our society is perpetrating moral catastrophes without thinking so. Um, you can see the kind of reasoning there is the same as the argument that said all the emeralds we found are green, so probably the next emerald is green, right? Uh, here it's Every other society has perpetrated moral catastrophes without realizing, so probably we are too. Um, and you can uh, you can stop maybe and think. You maybe you should pause the lecture and think about what you think about this argument. Does it seem right to you? Um, uh, you know, do you see any problems with it? Uh, but uh, I'll go on. Um, 
So uh, his second argument is what he calls the disjunctive argument. Um, suppose you're, you're the person who's in this situation. You say, oh, I agree with the inductive argument. I agree that uh, our society is probably perpetrating moral catastrophes um, without realizing it. And in fact, I know what they are. Um, well, even then, he thinks it's pro there are probably uh, are other moral catastrophes that you're not aware of, that you haven't noticed yet. Uh, and here is the, uh, here's the basic argument. Uh, he thinks, look, there are a lot of different ways that a certain practice, uh, that we might be seriously wrong about morality. And so suppose you think uh, you know, you think about a wide range of different practices, uh, you know, the modern prison system, uh, uh, you know, driving automobiles, buying factory farmed products, uh, all these different things that we do. Suppose you think that in any given case, you're like, yeah, I'm like 99% sure that that's okay or at least that it's not a moral catastrophe. Maybe it's not great, but uh, it's probably not, you know, a moral catastrophe like these other horrible things, right? Um, nonetheless, it might be that the odds that one or another of these things uh, probably is uh, a moral catastrophe, if there are enough possibilities, right? So, uh, if you think about the odds that any given chance, uh, the chance that any given person is born in March is low, right? One in one in 12 about. Um, the odds that somebody in this class of 40 people was born in March is pretty high because even though for each individual person, it's unlikely that they were born in March. If you have enough people, then it becomes likely that one or another person is born in March, right? In the same way, if you think of you know, 50 different things that we do in our society. And you think that in each case, it's very unlikely that this thing uh, is a moral catastrophe. It could be that all of these things together, the odds that one or another is a moral catastrophe are actually pretty good, right? Um, and he, he tries to motivate the thought that, oh, there are a whole bunch of different possibilities by listing different ways that we might be wrong about morality. Right. Um, so first of all, he thinks we might be wrong about which individuals are morally important or how morally important they are. Um, is an embryo as important as an adult human? Is a cow as important as an adult human? Um, are plants as important as it like maybe are all living things equally important, you know? Um, uh, second, we might be right about who is morally important, but wrong about what sorts of treatment are good or bad for them. Um, Richard Dawkins, I don't know if you guys know who Richard Dawkins is. He was sort of a celebrity atheist type person back when I was in high school thereabouts. He's, he's, uh, an accomplished biologist at, uh, who, I guess he's still a professor at Oxford. Um, but he, um, as part of his anti-religion campaigning, he said that raising children to be religious was a form of child abuse, um, uh, just in general, you know, not just raising them in some specifically abusive religious situation, but uh, just in general, teaching your children to be religious is a form of child abuse. Um, most people don't think that, you know, most people, uh, even if they're not religious, even if they think religion is bad, they don't think that their neighbor who takes their kids to church is a, is a child abuser, right? Um, if Richard Dawkins was right about that, then uh, even though we all agree that kids matter, then almost all of us have overlooked this terrible injustice that's being perpetrated against children uh, millions and millions of times over in our society, right? Um, Third, we might be wrong about the strength of certain obligations. Um, hundreds of thousands of couples divorce every year. Um, most people think, you know, that's not a great thing, but it's not a, a horrible thing, right? Um, 
Well, maybe you think, uh, I mean, suppose it turns out, hey, look, when you get married, you make a promise to somebody that you're going to be with them through thick and thin for the rest of your life. That's really important. So if you get divorced, that's really seriously wrong. Um, maybe outside of, you know, certain very special circumstances or something. If that turned out to be true, then, um, well, yeah, I guess the situation with divorce would be a moral catastrophe, right? Um, fourth, we could be wrong about how to weigh different obligations against each other. Um, people argue about um, how much you should tax rich people in order to uh, help other people, right? Um, if we're wrong about how to weigh those things, we might be doing something wrong. Um, we could be wrong about how to prevent and respond to injustice. Um, so in the United States, millions of people are incarcerated right now. There's mass incarceration. Um, in some cases, maybe you think actually people who are in prison for you know marijuana possession or something, they should, it's actually unjust that they're in prison to begin with. Um, but even where people have done, you know, genuinely really bad criminal acts, maybe it's bad that they're in prison, too, because we should treat crime as primarily a mental health issue, say. Um, or maybe we could be wrong about which bad situations you have a responsibility to alleviate. Um, how much do you personally have to do to help people who are severely impoverished, say? We'll, we'll talk at some point in this class about a famous argument from the philosopher Peter Singer that says that it's very seriously wrong, as, as bad as murder, for you to not give away uh, most of your disposable income. You're probably not doing that right now. Um, we could be wrong about our obligations to future generations. Maybe... Uh, you know, we should be putting a bunch of effort and resources into looking for, you know, meteors that might hit us, right? Uh, so that we can see, like, ah, there's an asteroid that could hit us in 100 years. We, we need to start researching how to shoot it down and stuff. And, uh, you know, otherwise, in 100 years, the asteroid will hit and people will be like, ah, there's people in the past. They didn't prepare us for this, you know. Or, uh, you know, some people want us to do research on artificial intelligence and how to make sure that we can control artificial intelligence so it doesn't kill everybody. These sorts of things, right? Um, so Evans is not saying about any of these specific examples, of course. He's not saying that he agrees with the example he's given, right? Uh, he's just saying all of these are things that, like, you could imagine it turning out that were wrong, I guess. Uh, and um, so he... Uh, he thinks, you know, given, and of course, each example, you know, each of these seven ways we could be wrong, there are a lot of different topics that we could be wrong about, right? Uh, lots of different situations where we have to weigh different obligations to each other. Lots of different contexts where we have to think about our obligations to future generations. And so uh, he's thinking if you, you know, you multiply all the different ways we could be wrong, the chances that we're wrong about something or other are really high. This is his, his thought. Um, and further, within each of these categories, for each topic, there are multiple ways to be wrong. Uh, you could have, uh, you know, too much uh, uh, of something or too little of something. Uh, you might, uh, you know, um, you, you might err in either direction. And so... That makes it because you kind of have to hit the sweet spot, at least on certain topics, um, you you have to, uh, you know, that multiplies the possibilities, the possible different ways that we could be wrong, right? Um, so that's that's the disjunctive argument. Again, you might stop and kind of ask yourself, you know, whether it whether it seems right to you uh, or, uh, you know, what what other implications it might have or whatever. Um, so now we come to William's practical suggestions. I mean, he's just argued that, yeah, probably we're doing something horrible and we don't realize it. Well, okay, what are we supposed to do about that? Um, well, in a case where we're doing something horrible and we do realize it, then the answer seems clear enough, right? Stop, stop doing the horrible thing, uh, compensate the victims, so forth. Um, but... If we know that we're probably doing something really wrong, 
but we don't know what it is. How should we respond to that? Uh, well, I mean, you can't just stop doing everything, right? Um, so what should we do? Um, well, uh, one option might be to try to hedge your bets. Um, uh, sometimes you try to play things safe just to make sure that you don't uh, you don't cause some awful outcome, right? Um, so if you're driving along and you're running out of gas and you see a station and you're not sure if you can make it to the next one or not, maybe you know the next one has slightly cheaper gas, but it's a couple miles away or something. Um, you might think, well, I should go ahead and stop and get gas just in case, you know, it would be, it would be really bad if I ran out of gas here. And so, um, uh, similarly, um, suppose you think, yeah, I mean, it's possible that eating meat is seriously wrong. You know, it involves killing some other living thing with thoughts and feelings and stuff. So, that, you know, just because you want to eat it, um, it's much less plausible that not eating meat is seriously wrong. Well, maybe you should hedge your bets and become a vegetarian. Even if you don't think that eating meat is wrong, you might think, well, as long as it's much more likely that it's wrong than that not eating meat is wrong, maybe it's safer to, to err on the side of not doing something seriously wrong, right? Um, but even though, you know, maybe that works in the vegetarianism case, but uh, maybe it doesn't work so well in other cases. Um, so he's going to suggest maybe there are some limits to the strategy for three reasons. Um, first of all, um, there are cases where uh, you can't really hedge your bets. You can't really play it safe because, again, you have to get things just right. And going too far in either direction would be seriously wrong. Um, <clears throat> So it's possible that we're fighting too many foreign wars and causing unjustified bloodshed. Also possible that we're fighting too few and we're failing to rescue people uh, who uh, are being oppressed by tyrants. Uh, there's no morally safe option there, right? Um, if uh, you can't really uh, decide, okay, we're never going to fight any wars because, you know, maybe some wars are necessary or something, right? Uh, on the other hand, you can't be like, okay, let's fight every war we possibly can, folks. Um, you you have to actually try to aim for getting the right answer to when you should fight or when you shouldn't, right? Um, uh, second, sometimes hedging against one catastrophe um, prevents you from hedging against another one. So we could do as much as possible to conserve the environment or we could do as much as possible to help people who are starving, um, but you can't do both because both of those cost resources and you have limited resources. So um, what you need to do is, I guess, try to figure out how much, how, what proportion of your resources should go to which cause. Um, third, uh, it might turn out that we're doing something that's seriously wrong that we, we haven't even thought, it hasn't even occurred to us that it might be seriously wrong. Um, and how are you going to hedge against that? You know, it hasn't even occurred to you that this thing might be, might be morally wrong. Um, and so uh, he thinks, yeah, okay, you can hedge your bets where feasible, maybe. But also, there are two other things you ought to do. Um, the first is that we need to take steps to ensure that uh, we can figure out as soon as we can uh, what are the moral catastrophes in which we're complicit. Uh, probably not going to figure it out in the next 20 minutes, but, you know, try to make sure that we can figure out as soon as we can what it is. Um, how are we going to figure this out? Well, we want to make progress in ethics and our understanding of right and wrong so that we can figure out what the true moral principles are. Um, second, we'll want to make progress in certain empirical fields, scientific fields, so that we can correctly apply the true moral principles. So suppose, for instance, it turns out that the true moral principles imply that you shouldn't kill conscious beings without some very good reason. Uh, well, then we need to figure out which beings are conscious, right? Are insects conscious? If they are, then it would be very wrong to kill them. If not, then not, right? Uh, so you need to figure out whether insects are conscious. Uh, 
you, you need, you know, if we have a duty to help people in need, then you need to figure out what is the best way to help people in need, right? Um, and so forth. Um, third, you need to get the people who are trying to make philosophical progress on ethical issues to talk to the people who are trying to make uh, the empirical progress so that they can come up with sound policies, figure out, uh, okay, so we have a duty to help people in need and this is the best way to do it. So, you know, okay, so we can put together a, an action plan. Um, and then fourth, uh, that knowledge needs to get dis uh, disseminated out to policymakers and people in the public and so forth. Uh, so it's sort of a four, a four step program, right? We need to, to make moral progress, make empirical progress, um, get these people to talk to each other so that we can figure out what are the possible catastrophes in which we're involved and how do we get out of them? And then you need to get other people who are in a position to act uh, to hear about all that. He thinks um, not only that we should do these things, but that actually we should put quite a lot of effort and resources into them, um, uh, akin to the uh, uh, resources that get put into fighting wars, say. Uh, it was worth fighting wars, he says, to end slavery or to stop the Holocaust. Since the unrecognized catastrophe is likely to be of comparable scope and severity, since it's quite possible that there's some catastrophe we don't know about that is, uh, you know, a similar world historical atrocity. Also involving the victimization of millions or something morally comparable to such victimization, halting it also warrants substantial war-scale sacrifice. Call it a war on our own backwardness. And then the other thing he wants to recommend is this point is this stuff about flexibility. Um, suppose at some point in the future that we figure out that some practice of ours is a moral catastrophe. Uh, well, that's not going to do us any good unless we also have the ability to stop doing it, right? Um, so uh, he thinks we should try to make society as flexible as we can so that as we gain new understanding of morally problematic practices, we can stop them um, with, you know, minimal costs, right? So um, we, we need to uh, make sure that we have, first of all, enough resources available to make the changes. Um, so if we realize, maybe you think we already know this, but suppose we realize in the future that Automobile travel needs to be almost totally eliminated because it's too environmentally damaging, or we need to switch over totally to electric vehicles or something. Um, well, that will be costly. Um, so we want to make sure that we can do it. Um, and second, it means that we want our uh, infrastructure and our institutions and the government, this sort of stuff, to be designed in a way that makes it comparatively easy to change them as new information comes in. Um, Many American towns and neighborhoods, including Tacoma, unfortunately, large parts of Tacoma, are designed so that you really can't get around them without a car. Uh, I lived in Munich for two years, and it's very easy to get around in Munich without a car. I didn't have a car in Munich. Here in Tacoma, much harder, uh, unless you're you know, living right in the city center or something. Uh, so because you have all this infrastructure, roads and stuff, that are set up on the assumption that people are going to be driving places, that makes switching to other modes of transportation a lot harder, right? Um, the city isn't set up to be walkable, say. Um, and so, uh, you know, maybe in the future as we design cities, we want to make them more flexible in design. Um, and third, we want our decision-making procedures uh, to be designed in ways that allow us to respond to new information. Um, with When it came to the prohibition of alcohol, uh, Congress didn't just pass some law in the normal way, it passed a constitutional amendment uh, banning alcohol, um, which is very hard to change, right? And Williams thinks this was a terrible idea because um, what it implies is even if a majority of both houses of Congress and the president who are going to be in the future, right? We're here of the people implementing prohibition. We know these people in the future will have seen what the actual effects of prohibition were, right? Um, if those people, having seen what the effects of prohibition were, most of them in Congress and the president think that prohibition is a mistake, uh, 
we're not going to let them change it. Uh, we're going to only let them change it once they can get a supermajority that they need to pass their own constitutional amendment. He thinks that was bad decision making. You want flexible institutions which are set up so that people in the future who have more information than we do can make the necessary changes when the time comes. Um, so those those are the the sort of the the three things that Williams suggests are hedging your bats. Uh, uh, cultivating flexibility and um, doing this stuff to investigate uh, ethically relevant issues to to figure out what the uh, what the possible possible moral catastrophes that we might be involved in are. And he thinks hedging your bets feasible in some situations, not feasible in others. Uh, but in general, these other two things increased invest investigation, increased flexibility. Those are things that we could do if we want. Um, and because we realize that, you know, realistically, we probably are doing terrible things without realizing it, we have strong reasons uh, to wanna, wanna cultivate those sorts of things. So uh, that being said, that's the Williams piece. And now we'll turn to uh, Appiah's piece. Um, which is a pretty short piece, but it's, you know, it's kind of punchy. I like it. Um, so uh, he notes, um, again, as I have and as Williams does, that uh, people in the past did all sorts of horrible things. They had slaves. They kept women from voting. They engaged in judicial torture. They would torture confessions out of people. Um, they thought that domestic violence of various sorts was okay. They did all sorts of stuff. Um, in my home state, Virginia, it would have been illegal for my fiance and I to get married until 1967. Uh, and that only changed because of the Supreme Court stepping in. The state itself didn't change it. It's my fiance and I, an interracial couple. So interracial marriage was illegal in some states until 1967. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, he thinks, look, you look back at stuff like that, you might think, what, the, what, what were people thinking? How did anybody think that, that was okay? Right. Um, and yet he thinks, look, chances are our descendants are sometimes going to look back at us and ask the same question. How did anybody think that was okay? Uh, he doesn't spell out why he says the chances are that they'll ask the same question, but I, I think he must have in mind something like the, the inductive argument that Williams gives. Um, uh, you know, this idea that, look, these people in the past have done terrible things, so probably we are too, right? Um, Yet at the same time, he points out, um, you can't just decide that every reform movement is good, right? You can't just, every time somebody suggests changing something, think, ah, that's, you know, the, the way of the future or whatever. Because um, sometimes the current way of doing things is, is the right way of doing things. Or sometimes it's not, but some suggested reform would make things worse. Um, the movement to abolish slavery was uh, a great thing. Uh, the movement for the prohibition of alcohol, uh, most of us think, was very misguided. Um, so, you know, if you were back in the 1920s and you thought, uh, well, you know, we're probably doing bad stuff, so I, I, I need to look for reforms we can make. Ah, prohibition. You'd made a mistake. Um, so uh, Appia wonders, is there any way for us to kind of tell which of our practices will stand the test of time and which won't? Maybe in some cases there's no option but just a long detailed investigation and whatever, but are there at least some things we can, we can latch onto as, you know, plausible initial indicators or something like that? Uh, and he thinks there are. Uh, and he offers three of them. Of course, none of these are going to guarantee that the practice will be condemned, that it's actually bad. Uh, but they're just, you know, things that might make you a little wary. 
things that might make you think, yeah, we need to look into this. We should be a little suspicious. Um, first of all, he thinks that the arguments against our bad practices, for the most part, probably already exist. Um, in this way, he's actually a little more optimistic, I think, than Williams. Williams is supposing, you know, there might be all these things we're doing that are wrong that just, it's, you know, it, it doesn't even occur to anybody. It's never even occurred to anybody that it might be morally wrong. Um, on the other hand, he's thinking if something is really horrible, probably somebody has already figured it out. Um, he notes in the case of slavery, for instance, it's not like people in the 1800s for the first time thought like, huh, maybe slavery is... The, the, the arguments for, against slavery had existed for thousands of years. Um, the problem was just that people didn't accept them, right, because of self-interest or whatever else. Um, and so, uh, you know, and so on for lots of other things. Um, so he's thinking, actually, if something is really horrible, somebody has probably already figured it out. Um, the problem is just that other people haven't come to agree, uh, agree with them yet. Um, so in a way, this is a little bit encouraging because it means maybe if we survey what sorts of criticisms people have given of our practices, we might have a chance of seeing all, you know, of, of figuring out what the problematic practices are by noticing maybe some of the criticisms sound plausible, you know. Uh, Um, a second worrisome sign is when people who defend the practice don't actually offer moral arguments of their own. Instead, they invoke tradition, human nature, or necessity. You criticize the practice and they just kind of look at you and they think, you know, well, this is the way we've always done it. Or, well, you know, it, I mean, it would be absurd to, to change that, you know, stop doing that. Um, uh, and when that's the reaction you get, that might make you think maybe there aren't any good moral counter arguments in defense of this, uh, this practice, right? Um, if, if anybody had a good argument in favor of it, then they would give that argument. They wouldn't just be like, well, that's the way it's always been, you know? Um, a third worrisome sign is when supporters of the practice engage in strategic ignorance. So they, they sort of intentionally avoid facts about the practice, which make them uncomfortable. Uh, they intentionally try to forget about certain things or not to learn about certain things or not to focus on certain things. Um, and he's thinking this sort of suggests that on some level, maybe they kind of know that the practice is morally problematic. They just don't want to think about that. Um, And so, uh, in light of these three criteria, um, uh, somebody's probably already come up with it, uh, with a, a criticism. Uh, people who defend it don't offer real moral counter arguments. They just appeal to tradition or whatever. Uh, and, um, sorry, it's late. Uh, the one I just said, uh, uh, people who defend it engage in uh, strategic ignorance. They ignore certain things that make them feel uncomfortable. Um, in light of those three criteria, Appiah is going to present four examples of practices uh, which are, I think he says, contenders for the condemnation of future generations or something like that. Things that uh, future generations might uh, condemn us for. Um, the first example is the contemporary American prison system. Uh, roughly 1% of adults in the country are incarcerated. That's a lot. One out of every 100 people in the country are in prison. Uh, the U.S. has 4% of the world's population, but 25% of its prisoners, highest proportion of anywhere in the world. Uh, the uh, majority of prisoners are nonviolent offenders. A lot of them are there on drug charges. Um, the full extent of the punishment prisoners face uh, is not just, you know, the official judicial punishment. Um, more than 100,000 inmates suffer sexual abuse, including rape each year. Some get HIV or other diseases from it. Um, at least 25,000 prisoners are held in isolation in supermax facilities uh, in, you know, extended solitary confinement and stuff under conditions that many psychologists say amount to torture. 
Um, of course, all of these things tend to fall disproportionately on racial minorities, on uh, economically disadvantaged people, you know, people who already face um, various sorts of uh, oppression or uh, disadvantage. Um, so that all sounds bad. And he thinks, look, we already know that that's kind of morally troubling. There are already people criticizing mass incarceration, right? Um, people who defend what we do usually do so in non-moral terms. They appeal to, well, you know, it would be so difficult to do anything about this, all these political problems, it would cost a lot of money to try to uh, change things. And we're inclined to avert our eyes from the details. People try not to think too hard about the fact that there are millions of people in terrible conditions and uh, you know, it's it's highly questionable whether this is an okay thing. Check, check, and check. So he thinks this passes his criteria uh, for uh, suspicious uh, practices, right? Things that we might get condemned for in the future. His second example is uh, industrial meat production. Um, every year, billions of animals are raised in factory farms. Um, they're kept in cramped, unclean conditions. Um, they can't move freely. They can't engage in their natural behaviors. Uh, many of them never get to see the sun. They get subjected to painful medical procedures, uh, castrating bulls or cutting the beaks off of chickens uh, without any anesthetics. Um, they suffer all sorts of health problems because they're overcrowded, they're stressed, uh, they can't get good rest because there's not room, there's not bedding, uh, there's bad, they're kept in a huge warehouse with excrement and all sorts of stuff around, so there's horrible air quality. Uh, they get given growth hormones to, uh, uh, you know, cause them to grow faster, uh, produce more meat. Uh, they get fed medicines um, that, uh, uh, you know, antibiotics and things to prevent because they're kept in these super crowded, uh, uh, not very sanitary conditions, you know, to prevent disease from sweeping through and wiping them all out. Um, slaughter is often painful. Chicken Chickens are, are treated the worst um, and... Uh, require um there are also many more chickens raised um so uh if if you're looking to like cut something out of your diet chicken and egg products would be the the first thing to start with i guess but um slaughter often can be painful so chickens um get uh crowded onto conveyor belt i mean this is one method of of killing them is you, you shackle them upside down and then I think they're dunked into water and electrocuted into unconsciousness. Then they have their throats slit and get dipped into scalding water to remove their feathers. But uh, sometimes that doesn't work correctly and they remain conscious while they're dipped in scalding water. Uh, so that's not good. Um, he uh, he notes um, the arguments against the cruelty of factory farming have been around for a long time. I mean, it's not anybody who looks at a, a picture of the place thinks, yeah, it's not so good. Um, people who eat factory farmed products rarely offer a moral justification for what they're doing. It's hard to really say anything in defense of it. Instead, they try to think uh, to not think too much about it. Um, there's even uh, the state of California. Um, has recently passed a, an animal welfare bill that would require that pork products, um, <clears throat> I mean, it's not like the pigs would be given great conditions, but they would have to be given, say, enough room to turn around uh, in, the, in this way. They couldn't be kept in a cage that's too small for them to, to move at all. Um, and the, the uh, animal agriculture industry is suing them, um, I think, on, on the grounds that uh they're saying it's like regular california is trying to regulate interstate commerce because 
producers in other states would have to change their practices so that they could sell things in California. I mean, it's it's something. the The thing that's notable about it is that the their case is not anything to do with any kind of moral justification of how the animals are treated. It's it's totally this kind of you know abstruse legal thing. Um, and uh, so he asks you, um, you know, consider not only that the European Union, for instance, already outlaws some of the worst things that are allowed in the U.S. So, I mean, it's possible, certainly, to improve conditions. Um, but, you know, imagine your grandchildren seeing pictures of factory farms. Uh, uh, you know, what are you going to what are you going to say? Say for yourself uh, when they ask you why you bought, bought stuff from there, right? Um, uh, his third example has to do with the treatment of the elderly. This might be something that you haven't thought about all that much, um, unless, you know, you have some personal connection to someone who, to some elderly person who was in a nursing home or something like that. Otherwise, maybe, you know, this, this often isn't widely recognized as a moral issue. Um, but he notes millions of elderly people wind up either institutionalized in for-profit nursing homes. And, you know, sometimes those places are nice, sometimes not so much. Sometimes they're very isolating. They can get abused by staff. Um, or they wind up living on their own, but they can be very socially isolated. Um, don't have many friends. You know, their family maybe don't live by them or don't check on them very often. Uh, you know, your spouse maybe died some years ago and uh, be very lonely, right? Um, and uh, Appiah thinks, look, things don't have to be this way, right? Um, he talks about his own mother in Ghana. She was British, but she wound up moving to Ghana, um, I assume, with his father. Um, and uh, there, as she became older, it was her good fortune not only to have the ability to stay at home, but also to live in a country where doing so was customary rather than being put into an institution, right? She had family next door who visited her every day. She was cared for by doctors and nurses who were willing to come to her when she was too ill to come to them. Uh, in short, and this enabled her to stay at home, right? Because the doctors would come to her even if she couldn't make it to them. Uh, in short, she had the advantages of a society in which older people are treated with respect and concern in a way that maybe they're not here. Um, he notes that uh, keeping aging parents and their children closer is a challenge, uh, particularly in a society where almost everybody has a job outside the home, if not across the country. You, know, you graduate college and move across the country. Um, yet the three signs apply here as well. Uh, when we see old people who, despite many living relatives, suffer growing isolation, we know something is wrong. Nobody, nobody listens to what I've just described and says, oh, yeah, um, sound, sounds fine to me. I don't understand what the problem is, right? Uh, you don't defend the situation, and when we can, we just try not to think about it. But self-interest, if nothing else, should make us hope that things will work differently in the future. In other words, when we're old, we better hope that... Um, that future generations don't treat uh, us the way that people treat elderly people now, right? Um, then his final example is the environment, and this one will maybe be the most familiar to your concern about the environment. Um, maybe you already agree, like, yeah, uh, our, our handling of the environment is very bad. We're causing climate change, pollution. Uh, he talks about deforestation, desertification, the expansion of deserts and the areas that used to be deserts um maybe you think uh, yeah no that's morally defensible yet you know we do that stuff anyway right um our descendants on the other hand are unlikely to have the luxury of such recklessness he says because they'll be the ones living with with the fallout of what we've done right uh they'll be the ones living in the the environmentally ruined world um and so they they won't be able to ignore it right um, and so he's given us these four, um, these four examples, but you know, there's no guarantee that those are the only four examples, right? He says, let's not stop there though. We all have our own suspicions about which practices will someday prompt people to ask in dismay. What were they thinking? 
And even when we don't have a good answer to, to what were we thinking, uh, we'll be better off for anticipating the question. And so um, I, I leave you, I'm going to set up a, a discussion thing soon. And um, part of what you'll be asked to do for your discussion thing is answer the question, uh, what other practices might prompt people to ask that in the future? So I would encourage you for now to start, start thinking about that, um, whether by applying Appiah's criteria or by applying, you know, thinking about it in some other way. Uh, what, what, uh, what, 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 might, what might be other things we do uh, that, that uh, will not stand the test of time? Right. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's this lecture.